The Palace of the Popes in Avignon is the world's largest Gothic building. Constructed over 600 years ago, this remarkable palace ranks among the 10 most popular sites in all of France, with nearly 700,000 visitors per year. Recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so you can see that it is definitely worth paying the admission to go inside. We'll have more twilight views to share with you later in the program. Powerfully built like a castle on the outside, on the interior, a sumptuous palace. It was built as a home for the popes because during the 14th century, the popes left the Vatican in Rome where they had always ruled from and relocated to Avignon here in France, staying for nearly a hundred years, making this the most important center of power in Europe for a century. The city's golden period, during which great mansions were built, money flowed in, the wall was constructed around the town for protection. They created a dazzling palace fitting to their high position of authority and wealth, filled with the finest furniture and artworks, creating a massive structure 15,000 square meters in area, about four times bigger than the typical Gothic cathedral. Although the original furnishings are long gone, the massive structure is original with cavernous rooms offering dozens of informative exhibits with furniture and art from the medieval period and multimedia displays explaining the history, ensuring that you will have a most entertaining and educational experience. The visit also includes use of a digital tablet that visualizes what is no longer there using some 3D technologies and augmented reality that gives you a 360 degree vision of what the palace looked like 800 years ago and how it has evolved. Some of the walls have their original frescoed murals still in place. It looks like tapestry or a wallpaper and some of them have religious themes, others have secular decorations. Just experiencing these ancient rooms and courtyards would provide a rewarding visit even if they were empty but your visit is greatly enhanced by numerous state-of-the-art displays, including period furnishings, sculptures, oil paintings, hundreds of artifacts, historic photos, special exhibits, the kitchen, audio guides, and detailed written descriptions. The displays are carefully designed and placed so they do not overwhelm or obscure the building itself, so you can still fully appreciate the original architecture. The vast outdoor courtyard, the Cour d'Honneur, is surrounded by the massive palace walls reaching 100 feet high. Enter the most impressive room, the Hall of the Audience, a huge space 150 feet long, 50 feet wide, with the 34 foot high Gothic vaulted ceiling and massive stone pillars holding it up. This famous space could hold as many as 600 people, functioning as a banquet setting, inquisition chamber, all-purpose room, and reception hall to impress guests. For a half century, it held the most important law court of Europe. The chambers divided into two naves by five clustered pillars from which the elegant ribs of the vaulted roof spread. You could also rent it out for a private cocktail party with a capacity for 700 people or a sit-down banquet for 500 people. The Grand Chapel is directly above it with the same large dimensions. The extraordinary plan of placing these two lofty chambers one above the other was a daring feat of engineering construction, built without any central columns holding up the vast ceiling. These medieval engineers cleverly used an external buttress to hold up the walls, as you can see when you're outside looking up. There is a lot to discover throughout the palace, with 25 rooms open to the public on various levels connected by steep staircases. They've done an excellent job creating fascinating exhibits that will keep you spellbound. They even have some very friendly palace house cats here walking around. Maybe they are on pest control because the interior of this place is very clean. It's really worth walking up to the rooftop observation deck for spectacular views of the palace and out across the rooftops of the old historic center of Avignon. You do have to climb up several flights of steps and the route up here might not seem too obvious, but just follow the signs which lead you up and outdoors, giving you this commanding view 
looking down at the Place du Palais and the Old Town. The view in the other direction takes in the scene of the Petit Palais, which is now a fine art museum, and the Rocher de Dome, a beautiful park that we will take you into later in the video. You'll also have an excellent view of the Basilica of Notre Dame. It's the Avignon Cathedral, the seat of the bishop, and when the popes were in residence, it was the main church in all of Christendom. First constructed from the 12th century in a Romanesque style, it's been modernized and revised ever since with the bell tower reconstructed in 1425 with a golden statue of the Virgin Mary on top. You'll get a variety of other views as you look around from this rooftop terrace. And if you're here at the end of the day, you might even get some evening twilight colors, perhaps the beginnings of a sunset, and the rooftop cafe might be open. A good reason for entering the palace in the very late afternoon when it's also less crowded. The palace is more like a fortified castle than a noble mansion with its massive battlements and lofty walls 13 feet thick. As you wander through open courtyards with numerous chambers, passageways, and chapels, you realize this was like a village within the city. The palace plan follows the irregular shape of the rock it sits on. Here, the various blocks of building were simply placed where required, and the different levels and irregularities of the ground were constructed upon with the most natural and convenient techniques, creating a delightfully varied appearance, impressive from every viewpoint. It may seem confusing, but there are good signs with walking routes that will keep you organized and informed as you proceed. If you pay attention to the details, watch the videos, read the informative labels and take your time, you could easily spend two hours inside the palace. Or you could get through in one hour if that's all the time you've got and still come away with a good feeling for what life was like back in the Middle Ages for the most powerful and wealthy people in Europe. In the West Wing, you'll see the large dining hall, the Grand Tunnel, stretching 48 meters, making it the longest room in the palace and with a soaring ceiling. The kitchen is at one end with a high pyramidal chimney vault. There was one lavish banquet after another, continuous festivities and enjoyment for the popes and friends. The palace became a place of richness and beauty, the walls glowing with azure and gold. A legion of Gallic sculptors and Italian painters lavished their art on the embellishment of the palace. The indolent voluptuousness, worldly splendor, and indulgences of the debauched clergy was notorious throughout Christendom. That time period has been called the Babylonian captivity, alluding to the way the popes were captivated by the decadence similar to that found in ancient Babylon. This was a time of wild growth with massive wealth coming into the city via the church, some from every manner of rowdy foreigner and merchant who could pay their way into the city. The last of the seven French popes finally returned to Rome in 1377, but then followed what's called the Great Schism, in which there were two different popes vying for power, one of them back in Avignon, who was referred to as the Antipope. This was not just an argument between two popes, but involved all of Europe that was divided between those supporting the French and those supporting the Italian. The conflict reached a peak in 1409 when there were three different popes, all competing for power, finally resolved by the Council of Pisa, and the pope's power was reestablished in Rome. However, the last anti-pope, the insidious Benedict XIII, did not leave this palace willingly, he proceeded to lead a life of such shocking decadence and anti-Semitism and scandal that the church could endure it no longer, and Emperor Charles V sent soldiers to evict him from the palace. But Benedict defended himself. For years, the palace was besieged, and finally he was defeated, but managed to escape out secret passages and make his way to protection in Spain, his native country. It was chaotic times for the church and an ignominious end to the history of popes in Avignon. The palace was home to bishops and papal officials for another 400 years, during which Avignon prospered as a thriving mercantile city. 
When finished with your visit, it's possible to walk out the front gates, but the suggested route naturally brings you through the gift shop and wine store at the rear exit. The shop interior is an authentic part of the palace itself, so you'll have that same medieval style of architecture with the Gothic rib vaultings up in the ceiling and massive stone walls all around you. Plus, the selection of items here in the shop is really quite varied. And the wine store is one of the best that you will ever find in a museum of any kind. Well, it figures. After all, we're in the south of France, and they have a wonderful selection of local and regional wines here. It is possible to get into the gift shop without paying for admission to the palace if you just want to come into the store and browse around and buy something, either through the back door or even through the front door of the palace, which would give you a quick peek of the courtyard as you walk back towards the shop. But as we've been showing you, you really do want to see the entire palace. It is so worthwhile. The back door sends you out to the old neighborhood where ancient Romans first established their town 2,000 years ago. Notice the simple Roman ruins on the right side of the small square. This remnant of small arch and paving is about the only trace of the thriving Roman colony that was here. While this was an important Roman town, it was located on their main road, the Via Agrippa, it never did rise to the level of prestige of Arles or Nîmes, but with a sizable Roman population of about 25,000. The narrow streets beyond this Roman site, behind the palace on the east side of town, are mostly quiet residential back alleys with few shops or sites of any historic interest. Energetic types might opt for a 10-block circular stroll in this northeast part of the old town. It's an authentic neighborhood with a genuine charm, and yet it's not going to be at the top of your list for things you must do while in Avignon. It's worth seeing if you have the time. It's a good example of why it helps to spend four days here, maybe five days. There are so many day trips outside of the city that will keep you busy. You could easily spend a week in Avignon. It's a good place for that aimless stroll, just wandering. Don't worry about what street you're on or where you're going. Get to the corner, take a look left or right, see what looks more interesting and go that way. You're not gonna get lost because it's a small area. It's a residential area. You can see there are people living upstairs. It's kind of that low rise, medium density, typical of Europe, the living city, a vital place with neighborhoods that have shops and cafes and easy walking distance. There are a few small hotels in this relatively out of the way quiet neighborhood, such as the Hotel Medieval, a small two-star place that has great historic charm with very good rates. And they have a small garden courtyard and you know the rooms are going to be quiet because this is a very quiet part of town. We're gonna to walk now from that area behind the palace over around to the big Place de Palais and then beyond up to the beautiful park on the hill, the Rocher des Dômes. Return to the Place du Palais along an ancient lane adjacent to the palace, the Rue Payrollerie, dramatically carved into the bedrock. It's like you're walking through a natural canyon. This will quickly bring you right back around in front of the palace and the Cathedral of Notre Dame. In a moment, we'll continue to a viewpoint on a hill, but since we're passing the palace again, let's consider what happened after the popes left in the early 15th century. It was still occupied by the church for another three centuries. And during the French Revolution, it was taken over by the Napoleonic French state for use as a military barracks and a prison, and later a stable. It was vacated only in 1906 when it became a national museum and has been under constant restoration ever since. Walk a few minutes north from the Place du Palais into a lovely public park called the Rocher des Dômes, resting on the top of a small hill overlooking the old town. From the ramparts, take in the beautiful views across the rooftops of the city and across the Rhone River. You'll also spot the romantic castle of Saint André in the distance and the famous half bridge, the Pont Saint-Benizet. 
You'll notice the Park of the Dome also has a beautiful fountain with a statue in the middle, a pond with ducks, and tree-shaded benches all around. It's a perfect combination for an ideal little park. And it's a great place for families to hang out. The kids show up here, they can pedal around in rented pedal vehicles, even a little horse and buggy with pedals to get by. And there's the cotton candy sales lady who's really dishing up some sweet treats for these kids. All in all, this park is a bit of a hideaway. You wouldn't notice it if you were just walking around in the shopping lanes of Avignon. You don't even really see it when you're at the Palace of the Popes. But it's there on the hill, just right next to the palace, so don't miss it. The view, the benches, the fountain, the statues, it's a great ensemble. And it's easy to walk down from here, down that little zigzag ramp. There's no escalators, no elevators, so you've got to do it on your own power. On the northern end of Palace Square, you'll spot the fortress-like Petit Palais, built in 1318 as a mansion in the medieval style with Gothic pointed arches and an interior courtyard. Now a museum, it houses a collection of 300 medieval paintings, including the masterpiece of Botticelli's Madonna and Child. You'll find that the main thrill is simply walking through this delightful mansion, once home to Julius II before he became Pope. He was the famous Pope who hired Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling and was also a great warrior leader Pope who expanded the powers of the Vatican throughout Europe. Strolling around in this park area, you're in good position to visit another one of the city's most famous landmarks. Coming down will bring you to the Pont saint benezé Avignon's legendary bridge built in the late 12th century and another UNESCO World Heritage Site. This was the only bridge across the Lower Rhone River when built connecting the kingdoms of France and Germany and thereby turning Avignon into an important trading center. Even though it only goes halfway across the river now, it was just broken down and collapsed in earlier centuries, and it was often restored, but it's been in ruins since 1669. And you'll find that it's rewarding to admire the view from different directions. On the bridge of Avignon, everyone is dancing, as in the famous 15th century children's song. How about a free boat ride? There's a ferry shuttle from the bridge across to the island that gives you some lovely views looking back, and it's free. On one of the piers of the bridge stands the chapel of St. Benazé, and two stories that was rebuilt in the early 13th century, and a second upper apse was added in 1513. You'll also get nice views of the medieval wall from the riverbank. Once in a while in your travels, you get lucky and you come across the rising full moon right about twilight, illuminating a brilliant scene. In this case for us, it was the Pont saint banizé We had been out driving all day on a full tour of Provence with our tour company, and then we came back towards Avignon and they stopped on the side of the river and got out for this spectacular view gaining a new perspective on how the Pope's palace looks at twilight, all illuminated on the banks of the River Rhone. Coming out at twilight, early evening, sunset time is one of the best times to take pictures. Don't be in a hurry to go to dinner at twilight. You might be better off walking around, enjoying the vista and taking some pictures, especially on a night with a full moon. The Bridge of San Benizé was built across the River Rhone in 1177 through 1185 under the direction of St. Benizé, and it was often restored, but it's been in ruins since 1669. In this segment focusing on cultural sites, we'll take you to a couple more museums in Avignon with fine art and history. One of Avignon's major museums is an art museum called the Musée Calvé, and is located in the lower section of Rue Joseph Vernet. 
The museum is set in a magnificent 18th century mansion with collections of fine art and decorative pieces from the 15th through the 20th centuries. You'll find excellent paintings in here representing most of the important phases of art history. Usually each great painter is represented by one fine piece. On the ground floor you'll find Roman antiquities. Notice in particular the very fine and detailed painting by Jan Bruegel the Elder. And you'll also find paintings from the 19th century by Jericho, Corot, enamel metals, ivories, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman antiquities, and the list goes on in this lovely Museum Calvé. And there's an archeological branch of this museum called the Musée Lapidaire, which displays sculpture from ancient Greece, Rome, and Egypt inside the chapel of a former Jesuit church at number 27 Rue de la République, just a few blocks away. In addition to ancient sculptures, the museum features common household items, urns, terracottas, jewelry, and bronze. Paintings from the 19th and 20th centuries are on display at another excellent small museum, the Musée Angladon, with masterpieces by Degas, Manet, Sisley, Van Gogh, Cezanne, Picasso, and Modigliani, among others. These main museums should be enough for most visitors and could keep you busy most of the afternoon. Another dozen smaller museums, archives, libraries, and historic homes are open to the public, so one could actually spend another full day in pursuit of all the culture offered here at Avignon. We have many more movies about Provence and the south of France in our collection, Arles and the artistic village of Saint Paul. We'll be taking you to the stone village of Le Beau, have some crepes, down to Nice, the beach, the old town. We'll see it during the daylight and take you back there at night. We'll be visiting historic sites and meeting the people. Pont du Gard, ancient Roman aqueduct. The quaint village of San Remy will charm you on market day with street music. You'll see shop dogs and ancient arcades. The daily joy of life in the streets is one of our specialties. We'll do some downtown shopping and enjoy traditional recreation. You can also find Aix-en-Provence, Cannes, and nearby Antibes along the sunny shores, and Marseille in our series of travel videos. All the best of southern France. Look for them in our collection.